Uh, I call this meeting of the Social Equity Subcommittee meeting to order. I'm Tom Velasco. I'll not take the role of the subcommittee members present at the meeting, uh, beginning with uh, Gina Cranwinkle. Present. Jeff Gallegos. Present. Nika Scott. Present. Nadar Hashim. Present. Ashley Reynolds. Present. David Shear. David He's Hiria. no longer on this committee. Okay, that's okay. Um, Susanna Davis. I think I saw him. And Lindsey Kirk. Not sure if she's here or not. Uh, okay. She's not going to be able to make it. And then, and, um, Julie in the room, can you tell me who's, who's there from the board? Oh, wait, TJ's here. Yeah, he's here. Um, so, just me from the board and Nellie. And then it looks like TJ Donovan has joined us. He's replacing <coughs> David Shear on this committee. And um, Lindsay Curley is not able to join us today, and we have one member of the public. Two. Great, thank you. Two. Oh, yeah, we have two. Oh, sorry. Two. <laughs> I can't see who comes in behind me. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. So thank you, everyone, for your attendance. Greetings to all of you uh, that have made the effort and have the interest to end, attend this subcommittee meeting. Since this is the first subcommittee meeting we have, uh, I wanted to do brief, and, and I do mean brief, introductions. Uh, for all the members of the subcommittee because we have a lot to do and discuss. Again, I'm Tom Alasco, I'm General Counsel for the National Association of Cannabis Businesses or the NACB, which is a national trade organization specialized in creating standards and best practices for the cannabis industry. Our goal is to legitimize and elevate the growing cannabis marketplace. And part of the NACB's function is to consult with state legislators and regulators uh, as we are doing with this engagement. My background is a 20 plus your attorney, focusing mostly on commercial and business litigation. I've been in the cannabis space for about seven or eight years, starting with partnership disputes and cannabis lawsuits that grew to compliance, employment, real estate issues, um, and serving on panels for the Arizona State Bar, where I'm based out of, and then panels throughout the country on issues like licensing, 280 and social equity. So it's my privilege, and NACB's privilege, to help coordinate these various subcommittee meetings that we've had throughout today, um, and we'll have going forward on Mondays and Thursdays and uh, helping create good policy for the state of Vermont. So before getting into the, the brief introductions for all the uh, esteemed advisory subcommittee members, I wanted to introduce uh, the members from the NACB that will be leading this group. Uh, Jeannie, do you want to say hello with a brief introduction? Hi everyone. So excited to have you all here today and excited to be working on social equity for all of Vermont. Uh, just a little background about myself. I've been with the NACB for about three and a half years now. Um, I also teach at the City University of New York for, o for over the past decade in public health and health sciences. I was also chief operating officer at a private wealth management company and you know, truly very passionate about social equity. You know, we last year, heard the cries of the Black Lives Matters movement and what we did as an organization was said, we're going to show you how these laws matter. And so we did a social equity model around it. And we've done conferences and comparison analysis of what's happening in different states. This year we are trying to develop um, diversity, equity, and inclusion standards in the workplace. Um, we have just come out, we are coming out with an article right now about the aftermath of incarceration. So, you know, we live and breathe this all the time. We're truly just blessed to be able to be here with you and to assist you with your social equity program. Thanks, Gina. Uh, Jeff, uh, you want to say hello and maybe briefer intro? Yes, my name is Jeff Gallegos. I'm an attorney in Los Angeles, California, uh, focused on civil rights and appellate advocacy and public interest law. And uh, I'm a career musician as well, and I'm thankful to be part of this. I have a heart for social equity. Thank you, Jeff. Danica Scott? 
Hi, I'm Danika Scott. I lead marketing uh, communications and strategic initiatives for NACB. I started in cannabis in 2018, primarily on cannabis banking and payments. And um, I have been a career marketer and communicator for over 30 years. Thank you for allowing us to be here. We are grateful. Thanks, Danika. And now our advisory subcommittee members, Nader Hashim. Thank you. I, my, my name is Nader Hashim. I worked as a Vermont State Trooper for a little under eight years. Uh, during that time, I was a drug recognition expert and served on the Fair and Impartial Policing Committee. Um, after about eight years, I was elected to public office, served in the Judiciary Committee in the House of Representatives, and currently I'm working at a private law firm in Brattleboro. Thank you, Nader. Uh, Ashley Reynolds? Hey guys, uh, President and Co-Founder of Elmer Mountain Therapeutics, full spectrum CV company here in Vermont. Uh, our main mission and principles of the business is creating safe, um, safe access to cannabis, especially for women and mothers. Um, I worked really hard in the beginning of starting this industry in Vermont to bring as many women into the industry as possible. Um, really lucky to see those same women that are still um, being successful today and extremely important to me to see um, social equity at the forefront of creating this brand new industry. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Susanna Davis? Hi, one of the I'm Susanna Davis, the racial equity director for the state of Vermont. Um, I am, this role is cited in agency of administration, but it is statewide, so um, it tends to collaborate with all the state agencies and the three branches of government, as well as local and federal partners. Uh, before this, I was in New York City government and the uh, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and before that at the New York City Council as the director of the Black Latino Asian Caucus. Thank you, Susanna, and thank you again, uh, all of you, for your, your time and your service on the subcommittee. I know we have a few members of the public in the room um, with Julie as well. I want to make sure that everyone knows that written public comments can be submitted electronically via the web form on the CCB website and have been since May 2021. I want to ensure everyone that your comments have been received, reviewed, and considered by each and every subcommittee member, and we do appreciate your input. There will be time at the end of uh, this meeting for public comments, as there will be at the end of every meeting uh, toward the end of the hour. And in addition, the CCB will be hosting dedicated meetings for public comments, both at the Friday board meeting via the public uh, link or at the CCB's public comment evenings that will also be posted on the website. So your voice will be heard and considered, uh, but we do have pressing deadlines on us, particularly for social equity. Uh, and it's critical that we have constructed. Um, um, yes. This is TJ Donovan, Vermont Attorney General. I think I'm a member of the social I'm equity conference because Dave, Dave, yeah. Dave shared became the general counsel of the board. Uh, it was <laughs> like Good to see you. Good to see you. Sorry, I, I don't want to uh, interrupt your introduction. Go ahead. TJ Dunham, Vermont Attorney General. Look forward to working with you all. Thank you, TJ. Um, Tom, before we get started, um, can everyone on the call see the screen that I am sharing the PowerPoint presentation? Okay, very good. And if anyone decides that we need to go back or anything, um, you know, we can do that. I'm, I'm driving the bus. Thanks. And I apologize again, TJ, but uh, I was just about to turn it over to Danica. Um, and then again, uh, Danica, if we could keep track of the time, uh, leave at least 10 to 15 minutes towards the end for, for public comment. Thanks. A absolutely. I'll go straight to it. So uh, the request was made to please uh, give a summary of the public comments that have been received. So that is exactly what we're going to do. While I'm not gonna read these aloud to everyone, you'll receive these um, afterwards and they'll also be posted online. I believe we lost Ashley Reynolds, so uh, give us, there we go. She's joining us right now. Okay, fantastic. Um, but the comments that did come in quickly are, um, that equity and inclusion priority for the future adult market, um, of course, vacating all marijuana convictions, um, being a possession of distribution was another one that was heard with a focus on BIPOC, which stands, of course, for black indigenous people of color. 
um, cohort, and that would be social equity applicants um, was something that was out there. They want people to stay engaged and have direct lines of communication with the board, uh, which as Tom mentioned, many of those are able to be done through um, public meetings that are held. Also, um, someone posted about hosting more public meetings uh, around social equity and social justice with experts, including Minority for Medical Marijuana and the Last Prisoner Project. One of the articles that Gina referenced, just to let everyone know, NACB has done an article on one of the employees of the Last Prisoner Project, Stephanie Shepard, that'll be coming out um, in October that surrounds the aftermath of incarceration as um, she was a convicted felon and spent 10 years in prison. Um, also, someone offered some recommended reading. There is a link to the book, Chasing the Screen, The First and Last Days of the War on Drugs. Um, and a minor summary was also given. So those were three different comments made since um, the CCB offered the ability to post public comments online. And for everyone who is either watching or in the room, if you'd like to make public comments, you may do so directly from the CCB's website. This will also be available once this recording is posted, as this deck will also be out online. Thank you, Tom. Okay, thank you. Um, Nikki, did you want to take it over? I can, or I can most certainly turn it over to Gina or Jeffrey uh, to talk about the purpose of the Social Equity Subcommittee. Um, Gina, Jeffrey, if one of you guys would like to take it, please feel free, or I'm happy to do so. Um, so I'll take that over. Thank you, Janika. So we just first wanted to go over what the purpose of the Social Equity Subcommittee um, board is all about. Um, and this is really on how do we rectify a wrong for those who were disproportionately impacted on the war on drugs, um, specifically for Vermont. So there are things that we have to determine right now, which is um, coming up, to find and determine application criteria for candidates. We need to develop a plan to ensure participation within the industry. One of the things that I really want to note here this is not just about getting people licenses. I want to think of strategic ways on how we can have an inclusive industry. How do we get people into, you know, a starting fields or cultivation? How can we provide education to those who really want to come into um, who are social equity candidates? Um, and how do we provide ways to reduce or eliminate fees for licensees in the industry? So I will hand this off to Jeffrey, who will go over the purpose of our social equity program, especially from you know, a federal constitutional level, and then be going into some of the laws that um, Vermont has already handled and some modelings that are out there that can give us a better understanding of social equity. So I'll hand this over to Jeffrey. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. So the overall purpose is, a, a, from what I understand, is a remedy for an injury. And so there's the basic purpose, and we have uh, NACB models post online. You can go to the next slide. So here we go. Here's where Vermont legislation comes in. So the, the phrase social equity applicant, this is kind of the, really the only place that it c comes up, and it's not really clearly defined what a social equity applicant is in the statute. And so part of the subcommittee's purpose is to come up with criteria for what that means. And part of the reason why it's uh, important to, to to identify the criteria because one of the benefits as you can see from this section 13 of act 62 is its access to this cannabis business development fund and that's uh, located in, in section 987 988 of title 7 that's kind of the detail of what what the money's to be used for uh, but that's one of the benefits of being a social equity applicant we go to the next slide so here's so in reading the entire act the only place i could find a really tied what the legislature meant by social equity is this part right here. Um, so real quickly, we'll talk about the fees because that's one of our first deadlines is to find out how to reduce and eliminate fees. And then social equity, um, in this, so if you look deeper in the section, it identifies both an injury and the beneficiary of what social equity means. So the injury is the disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. And the beneficiaries are individuals from communities that have been injured and individuals that directly have been injured. And so I kind of like, right now, I'm, 
I'd like to ask Nader, who was a member of the Vermont legislature, so we're lucky to have some living, breathing legislative history in the circle right now. Um, when you were there, did the legislature discuss what social equity meant? I mean, we, we had extensive conversations about it, and we did talk about um, social equity, um, although that was not at the forefront. The, the primary thing we focused on in judiciary um, had to deal with uh, traffic safety. That was one of them. Um, but when it came to social equity, we did often talk about expungement, the expungement side of things. So am I correct in saying that the purpose of social equity is a remedy for an injury? Does that sound right? I, I would say that's part of it. Um, a remedy for an injury in terms of social equity. I, I think it's also, it, it also involves dealing with removing um, disparities and barriers when it comes to entering this sort of market or this sort of industry. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure I'm not talking out of school. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And here's another benefit for social equity applicants for uh, um, individuals who have been historically disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition is uh, access to this um, outreach and training and employment program that provides economic opportunity. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And then Gina, if you would go through the NACB social equity model, please. Um, so this is what, after doing a comparison analysis of social equity models in the different states that are available now, um, we've determined that there are many things that we have to consider. Um, for one is that we disproportionately impacted areas. A lot of people have been viewing that as a number one concern, um, where it's high incarceration rates, low social economic background. Um, and obviously these people have had a disadvantage and they've been highly targeted on the war on drugs. During our community outreach and the information that was provided to us, we have realized that um, based on your social demographics, um, there are some areas that have very high um, income and very low income who live right next to each other. So that is a very unique thing about Vermont and something that we will be addressing when we have to think of what uh, the qualifications should be for a social equity license. And the next slide that I really want to bring you to is to really understand the difference between what is social equity and what is DEI. Um, this was briefly mentioned by Jeffrey just recently about what is social equity, and I'm getting that right. Um, and there's the major difference is was the individual disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. Now, if we can show harm, you know, um, people of color had higher rates of incarceration due um, to cannabis, we can show that that was harm and that was impact. Um, the same thing with lower social economic community. If we can, um, then we have to go to the conclusion of are they historically underrepresented individuals in businesses, in government, in society? Now that would be considered to be diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now, one of the major things that we always have to look at is the judicial review in a social equity program. If we cannot show that they have been harmed by cannabis prohibition, you know, we will have a big challenge um, if that ever gets um, to do just overview. So we want to make sure when we're enacting anything for the social equity program that we really have um, a scrutiny test. Um, with that being said, after our community outreach, it does seem that Vermont is very in support of, of social equity and DEI. So my one recommendation to the board is to create both programs and have the subcommittee look at both characteristics 
and how would that look like? Um, I okay. would love to find out um, the subcommittee members' feelings about that. And we'll talk about more about social equity in a few minutes. Ashley, um, how do you feel about um, looking over both social equity and DEI? Um, honestly, I think it's really comprehensive that we're tackling it in this manner. Um, I've definitely had some constituents reach out to me from the um, Abenaki um, tribe, if I can say that, and I feel like you know there's a lot that's being talked about for you know, the BIPOC community, you know, and I feel like there's one voice that we're not really discussing that we have a larger population in Vermont than a, a lot of others, and so. Um, I, I myself felt like I, I should have really brought that into my landscape when I was thinking about social equity for cannabis. Um, that's not a demographic I was thinking about, so I just want to present that to you guys and to the board. Um, and then if we're also thinking about creating diversity, equity, um, you know, are we looking at you know, a, a residency requirement for these licensees? Are we looking at, um, you know, you were talking, Gina, I guess, about, you know, if we can't find this licensee, if we can't create this um, perfect scenario um, to right the wrong, um, now then what? Um, so I, I find myself thinking I was really feeling really like sheer footed about being on this uh, subcommittee and now I'm like, well, there's a lot of people I, I'm not thinking about. Um, or there's maybe people that, I mean, maybe are outside of the state thinking they want to come into the state to create that diversity. So um, I, I don't have a good answer for you right now. I'm still really getting information um, from what our constituents are really wanting, from what I'm seeing as, as potential issues um, for writing the wrong in the state. I was read, reading through what some of the expungement um, requirements are as they lay, are laid out now. Um, certainly, I, I like the idea of violent offenders. You know, I, I think that's or nonviolent offenders being expunged. But seeing that the limit um, of the amount that someone was in possession when they were arrested is only two ounces, I feel like I don't know anybody who's distributing and getting arrested for that that was only distributing two ounces. So I feel like that's really an out of touch um, way to create any kind of expungement um, for the state of Vermont. Um, I've definitely firsthand seen um, family members and friends um, be put in jail for this plant uh, in the state and ruin their lives and ruin their family's lives. Um, they happen to be white people, um, but they're native Vermonters and I care deeply about expunging them. I care deeply about creating a space for them. They know how to grow. They know how to take care of their families, they know how to pay taxes, they know how to um, survive here in Vermont and have for many hundreds of generations of years. Um, and I want to make sure that those people's voices are, are heard. Um, but I don't know exactly how to, how to do all that. You know, this is, this is a big issue. I'm really glad that Vermonters are putting this at the top of their list. Um, but, but it's not like a lot of states that have legalized. Like straight up, it's not. Don't have the same diverse population and, and therefore this isn't as um, as kind of black and white, if you want to call it, in, in those manners. It's, it's not. It's not like that in the state. Um, and I just want to make sure that we're including Vermonters, real Vermonters, <laughs> um, as it sits today, um, versus trying to create create a market that you know all these people are here, all these people are ready, um, but maybe maybe not exactly the same level of diversity that that we're hoping for. And you brought up a lot of great points, Ashley. Um, you know, I'll first touch upon, you know, the question that you had about residency. You know, we have the same question, and that is something that we will be discussing in the subcommittee group. You know, um, right now, the social equity program, which um, only has $500,000 that's allocated to it so far, there potentially could be money coming in from integrated licenses and then there'll be um, funding once the industry is up and running, but we have to make a distinction, you know, do we want to put a residency requirement on it so that we can ensure that it goes to people who have been in Vermont um, during the time period that we are speaking about. Um, and so we will definitely discuss that. 
we will definitely go over social justice. I know that there is concern about, I think right now there's only one ounce that is um, being able to come off and now two ounces, but exactly, you're not being incarcerated um, for those levels. And we really have to talk about how we get that off their sentencing. You know, how, how do we allow these people who have been injured because of the war on drugs that were in prison or are in prison for this, um, um, what do we do? How do we give them their life back? So we would definitely be speaking about those issues. And um, I do see, Nader, your hand up. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to throw in one uh, piece of information that I think is important to consider, which is that you know when we're looking at the residency requirements, um, you know Vermont has I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but Vermont has a rapidly growing minority population, um, especially in Wyndham County, the southeast corner of Vermont. And I think that we just want to. I, I just want to advise that we should give some pretty good consideration as to what the residency requirements will be, because that is something that will affect um, primarily five black people uh, around Vermont. Just want to throw that out there. I agree, Nita. I agree, Nita. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I wanted to second that too. That that was something that was brought up to one of my constituents as well. It's like, okay, you make the residency requirement really, you know, two years, five years, then the tiny pool is even tinier that we have to, to create this, the, the right side of the wrong. So I'm sorry, Gina, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, don't worry, interrupt all, all, as many times as you want. That's how ideas flow. Um, TJ, I would love to hear from you and your thoughts on this. Yeah, thanks, Gina. Um, I, I agree with uh, what I think Ashley said about the complexity of this. Um, I like the idea of being as broad and as inclusive as we can um, to the point Nader made about making sure that we're acknowledging uh, folks that are coming to Vermont. Um, and it's, it's complex. Um, I'm, I think, disappointed to hear that the, the fund only has $500,000 in it. Um, you know, the access to capital is a big part of this. Um, and, and we need to discuss that. So um, I, I appreciate, um, I, I think, what you laid out in terms of the differences of social equity and I like the framing of the remedy to, to, um, to address the harm. Um, but I also, it sounds like the, the diversity and inclusion and equity would be much more broad and, and inclusive um, in terms of creating that pool of applicants. Um, but this is, I think Ashley's right, I mean, Vermont's a, Vermont is, 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 is a, it's a complex place and um, I want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to participate in this. Um, you know, the expungement um, issue, it, you know, I'm happy to make sure that we have a legislative um, proposal for January um, and I, Dave Sher would know this off the top of his head, I don't know it, but so the expungement is only to one ounce or less right now on, on the possession? It, yeah, so it's it's automatic for the one ounce or less. You can get any possession amount uh, expunged if you apply. Okay, so is there any, is there any marijuana conviction that is not expungible anymore? Yeah, the all the um, all the selling the sale dealing is still not okay. expungement eligible. Yeah. Yeah. And also anyone with violence, correct? Violence or and a gun or any sort of weapon. Is that, is that correct, David? I mean, our, our when you're just talking about possession, that wouldn't really play into it. Uh, there's no like possession offense that also takes into account you know possession of a weapon or something like that there's other regulate like other rules around expungement for other offenses you may have gotten that may make it hard or impossible to expunge the possession offense but taking possession by itself 
It's just any any possession amount can be expunged. I, I agree with you, um, TJ, in all of your points that you've made. One of the things that I would like to say is that we want to make sure that, you know, the social equity, which was supposed to go for grants, loans, and, you know, education, um, that we still hold it for the social equity applicants and, um, you know, see, you know, with diversity, equity, inclusion, what other funds are available for them. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, we would definitely need to speak to the Cannabis Control Board about this so we can go further and see, can we be more inclusive? And I think that we also need to take steps with working with banks and seeing, you know, um, you know, state banks, how can we get low interest loans for them? So maybe we're subsidizing the loan instead of, you know, just, just giving out a grant. Um, because at the end of the day, if we start dividing this by, we don't know how many candidates um, will come forward, you know, is, is $10,000 really going to make any substantial difference? And it's, it's not going to be. But I will say that I have a couple of ideas that we, that will make this um, an interesting way on how to be able to help the social equity licensee. And I think we just really need to get think outside the box and that's the great thing about Vermont you're really a small state you have more flexibility which these larger states wouldn't be able to do um, Susanna can I um, do you have any comments that you'd like to add and how, and how do you feel about social equity and DEI program I feel really good about social equity <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm listening um, to everything that's being said, and I agree with a lot of it. I also have hesitation about residency requirements. We have a lot of people who don't live in Vermont simply because they were pushed out or because of the sense of I'm going to be discriminated against or I have been discriminated against. And so um, to, to some extent, if we implement a residency requirement that's too stringent and we're effectively rewarding people for enduring discrimination and punishing those who left because of it. So I would ask us just to consider that um, and, you know, again, on the topic of whether or not we should consider funding amounts, I'm, I'm somebody who strongly believes that government at all levels has money um, and that if we want to move the needle and really make meaningful change, then it's going to require us coming, um, it, it's going to require that we feel it, you know, and not just do the easy low cost or no cost thing because, um, it certainly came at a great cost to, um, to have the policies we've had on the books for, for this many years now. So um, we talked about a whole lot, and at this point I've forgotten the earlier part of the conversation, but so far I, I like what I'm hearing. If there's anything specific you want me to address, I'm happy to. I just, I couldn't keep all the thoughts together at once. Do you support this committee looking at a social equity program and a DEI program? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, because I think that we're talking about multiple tracks, right? One is about percentage or proportion of representation, not just in markets, but in society in general. And then the other track is really reparation of harm or, or you know, correcting harm, right? Um, and the question, of course, for us is harm that was just inflicted by or in Vermont or harm across the nation as a whole. Um, and that's another question that we can get to, but I, I do think that they can be distinguished as different tracks and it's really worth exploring. Can Thank I you so in? much for your comments, Susanna, that are really important. Jeffrey? Yeah, I kind of wanted to, to go on what uh, Susanna was just saying about having the two different tracks. So um, one of the, the challenges that has come up, I'm glad this slide is still up because um, from different states, uh, people have gotten sued over this. Um, you know, someone feels left out and they'll bring a lawsuit saying that the law is unconstitutional and then then the, the court will have to review it based on a, a series of three different hurdles. And so the strict scrutiny test is the highest hurdle that uh, a law will have to overcome to be deemed constitutional. And so as we're entering the process to have this concept in mind to identify the compelling government interest which like from earlier, so earlier we were kind of distinguishing the social equity program as, as the remedy, and then the DEI is, is a different track. So let's focus on like the, the social equity injury part is the 
compelling government interest is repairing that injury, and then after after you identify the interest, you have to narrowly tailor the law so that it accomplishes that government interest. And so for Vermont, what we and also I'm glad we have a person who's got experience in law enforcement on our subcommittee because we need to ask the questions of like what how did cannabis prohibition go about in Vermont and so the statute uses the words cannabis prohibition not war on drugs and so let's focus on cannabis let's uh, identify what a normal impact is and identify what a disproportionate impact is and then the, pe the people that have been just people in communities I should say um, have been disproportionately impacted are the ones that qualify for the remedy um, and so another thought, another thought too is we're going through uh, this conversation is to identify what communities mean. Is it a geographic location? Is it a group of people? And so that seems to be kind of another topic that, uh, you know, for Vermont, a geographical approach like some other states have taken may not be the best way to go. And so just as we're, as we're entering the process, just have in mind that if, if something happens and the, the law is challenged, that we'll be able to clear that high hurdle of the strict scrutiny test. I think we can go to the next slide after that. And I just want to add to that, you know, that is something that we're going to discuss on Monday. You know, who is a social equity candidate? Who would be a diversity, equity, and inclusion um, candidate? So, you know, just keep that in mind over this weekend when you're thinking about it. But I also just want to piggyback on what Jeffrey said. A lot of states have tried to include so many people, and they have had a lawsuit because they then can't show harm that has been done by the prohibition of cannabis. Um, so we don't want to get into that situation as well. And Nader, I just wanted to know if you would like to add anything. I know you made a comment earlier, but did you have any additional about this one topic? Uh, nothing specific. I mean, I'm in support of creating these two different pathways, um, and I think it speaks to the conversation that Jeff and I had earlier regarding social equity, um, where it's not just a harm that's caused, that can cause, cause somebody, but also a uh, dealing with barriers and uh, hurdles that uh, different communities face when they're trying to get into this industry. Not only, so much for that. How, how has Vermont law enforcement um, approached cannabis prohibition? Well, that's a really large question. I mean, I can't speak for every agency. Um, I, I can describe my time when I was a trooper. Um, when, when it comes to cannabis prohibition, you know, from from that inside cultural standpoint with the Vermont State Police, the police who did drug interdiction were mostly seen, were often seen as the ones who were, you know, higher up on that hierarchy of uh, of, of being a good trooper and so you know the more drugs you got out of a car you know the, the better of a trooper you were seen as among your peers uh, and you know when it came to drug addiction and DUI addiction those were the major points when it came to you know getting promotions or getting on special teams and that sort of thing so if drug addiction was seen as a good thing so, so there was an incentive to, to uh, enforce? Definitely. Uh, there's also an incentive to not mess it up and not do it if you don't know what you're doing because uh, messing up drug and addiction is a... And then this actually could throw out for the people that uh, are watching in the public that want to comment um, if you can share thoughts about what the impact has been for uh, citizens of Vermont uh, with the cannabis prohibition. That's something. That's information that will help the subcommittee as well. Um, I think thank, I can, you, thank you, Nader, for that information. Well, and we've spoken about this slide. You know, it's a strict scrutiny test. You know that when this gets to judicial review, that's what we're going to be looking for. You know, how can we make um, how can we show injury? Um, you know, and the things that we need to focus on is what happened during cannabis prohibition. Um, what was that impact to people and or different groups? Um, 
is this an individual, is this community that we're going to be looking at? Um, and even just I, how do you- Can I ask a good question? In terms of the injury and the prohibition, is there a time frame in which we're looking at in terms of the lens? Is it the last 30 years, is it the last 40 years? Because the criminal justice system, while not perfect, has evolved. Um, particularly in the last 10 years, even with prohibition. And not to get too much in the weeds, you have a, you're gonna have a very different approaches because law enforcement is, it's a, it's a local control issue. It's a county-based system. And so you have a lot of disparities even within Vermont based on the counties. And so I'm just, I'm wondering as we frame this, are we looking at it over the, what is the time frame we're, we're, we're looking at? I love that question. The, the, the um, prohibition of cannabis has evolved since 1937. And then, so there's like, I look at cannabis prohibition as like three kind of phases. So there's the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act, there's the Controlled Substances Act in 1970, and then there's the, the Omnibus Crime Bill of 1994. And then as you said, uh, Mr. Attorney General, about how the enforcement has changed over the last 10 years. So thinking about who's gonna be joining the market now would probably be people that have been that were impacted starting around you know between controlled substances act and uh crime bill of 94. okay thank you that, 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 that's very helpful for me to frame this to, to to think about um those who have been impacted uh because i do think the last 10 years particularly in some parts of vermont it, it's been essentially even before decriminalization it was de facto decriminalized through diversion programs and now that but that was not consistent on a statewide basis and again this is a, we can get into the complexity but i appreciate jeffrey the the framing the time the time framing of this because I, that's helpful for me to, to think about that well i think it's helpful what you just said about measuring the impact too because um the impact has changed over the years and so what is disproportionate and what is a normal impact or what is a light impact it's another thought for the subcommittee sorry to step in but gina we're about um five minutes until we need to start taking some public yeah we're, we're going to be wrapping up shortly uh jeffrey if we can if you can go over the proposed bill um for months, age 414. And um, this gives us the best information of what a disproportionately impact area is. So this goes back to what I was saying earlier about what is the, what does communities mean for Vermont? Is communities a geographical location or is community something more underlying? And so this, this proposed legislation from Vermont is similar to what we've seen in other states, which kind of identifies a, a geographical area. And here's a criteria that can define what an area is. Um, you know, the, the, what an opportunity zone is, a census tract, poverty rate, uh, SNAP assistance, and the uh, high rates of arrest, conviction, and incarceration related to cannabis. So that's, 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 this one is, is in the works right now in the uh, Vermont legislature, but it looks to me like this is more focused on a geographical thing. So that's something for the subcommittee. Do we want to go into a geographical classification or do you want to go into what, is, what does community mean in Vermont and is it limited to, to geography? That's, that was the idea of this slide. Which we, yes, and we're just, you know, going to end this on really what our upcoming priorities are. You know, we need to define what social equity is from, you know, who is that, what, who potentially be, couldn't be that licensee or that candidate. Um, you know, as Jeffrey has just said, you know, is that a geographical location or is it just groups of people? Um, we also have to consider about, you know, these DEI programs. Um, do we create these two separate programs? Um, how do we reduce or eliminate licensing fees? Um, and how do, you know, one of the things that I will also want us to think about is how do we ensure an inclusive industry? So how can we get people into other positions within the job? And not even, you know, do we, you know, promote for minority companies um, vendors? You know, can we, can they supply things to them? Do we support um, minority products? 
um, you know, other ways that we can really create an inclusive environment that may not touch any, that may not actually work in the industry, but are ancillary businesses uh, for the industry. Any comments before we get to public comments? Yeah, let's just say something, Gina, what you just said as far as the inclusive part of it, um, this more goes into the licensing priorities in section 903A1 through 5 in the Vermont statute, um, is that the, that a business plan, I think it's A3, a business plan that is inclusive can get you ahead in the line for licensing. Uh, and that is are deeming as a social equity potential candidate is if you can hire 51% of social equity candidates as a, for your business. So those are also an inventive ways of how we can get more candidates into the industry. Any comments, thoughts before we move on for public comment? Okay, thank you. I'll hand it over to you, Tom. Thank you. Uh, Julie, I know we have some some in-person attendees. We do. Uh, do they have any, any questions for the subcommittee? Uh, no. No public comments this time. Thank you. Um, did, I'll, Gina and Jeff, I'll, I'll let you jump in if you had some closing comments. I, I, I had a couple thoughts uh for the committee just to help steer it um but if, if we have more if you guys have more to say i, I want to give you that opportunity no, no tom go first yeah sure um I, I was uh i was scribbling down just a couple thoughts on, on what has been said obviously this is a, it's a big topic um it's a big aspirational topic and this it, it started um uh, I'll just start with some broad brush strokes. Nationwide, obviously, uh, last year, last summer, um, this spurned on a lot of programs. Some of them were in existence, but a lot of them developed then. And there's been varying success across the country. Uh, and, and people wanted to be these programs, um, you know, not unlike the discussion today. Uh, in, include everyone, let's, let's figure out how to do this. And you're reading a lot about how a lot of programs aren't meeting up to their those lofty expectations. Uh, so there there is that element out there, and there there will be that struggle with this committee about how to achieve all this and how to make it a successful program. And what has been said, yeah, a lot of it is going to come to how much capital capitalization can you help uh, these applicants with, because that's just the reality of the cannabis industry right now. It's not cheap. Um, to make it, but a couple things that uh, were said uh, as far as uh, the residency requirement, that's pretty standard uh, across the different states, and I, I, I hear you on why you, you want to get rid of it, but just consider this. One of the reasons that it's in there, the primary reason I think, is to keep out the, the MSOs. Uh, so just realize the other side of what you're doing and maybe some unintended consequences of you, you know, discarding the residency requirement because you will just be opening the door um, to some actors out there that you may not want to be doing that for. The second thing is... The, the Tom, Tom, this is TJ. What, what, is, what is an MSO? Uh, so those are the multi-state operators. Those, those are the big players out there. And some of the, the concerns and the dangers of the social equity program is that those, those players will come in and partner with a true social equity applicant um, and then take over that, that license, right? Um, and that's what's happening today across, across the country. Um, the second thing, is, and this is, this, is more of a, this is more of a broad concept, is when Jeff and Gina were talking about the constitutionality challenges social equity programs and this goes all the way back to you know for the lawyers or even non-lawyers but um, there have been constitutional challenges things going back as far as you know affirmative action and a lot of those racially based programs 
that those exist certainly with within the cannabis industry, specifically with social equity programs. And there is straight language from some of the states, I'm not saying this will happen in Vermont, uh, but you should be aware of the dangers of it. And I'll, I'll just read you from this case, and this is from Ohio, this is the most famous one that's found un unconstitutional. While remedying the present effects of past discrimination can be a compelling state interest. And that, that's the strict scrutiny, part of the strict scrutiny test that Jeffrey was talking about. While that can be a compelling interest because they had as part of their social equity program, racial elements to it. The state does not have, does not have a compelling interest in remedying generalized societal discrimination, which is what people usually talk about when they're talking about a social equity program. So what we have with the Vermont legislation, and I'm aware of it, you have, they're saying, well, we, we need to give preferences, and I, you know, I've even seen the quote from the, from the governor about this, preferences for social equity, and they've combined into that preferences for social equity and the other underrepresented groups, the DEI groups that you're talking about. And you can try and parse it out into different programs, social equity and DEI. But when I'm looking at this, and I'm, I'm happy to take any other analysis of this, uh, because I, I know there's, there's folks with experience with this, but I think both those programs fall under the same scrutiny uh, that you know a social equity program would, and I don't know how you could distinguish from one of the, on the, another. The other thing that is looked at heavily in these cases, um, and I think it was kind of addressed in, in the slides, is when you're trying to remedy that past discrimination, courts did not accept even data or evidence from other states or the ACLU. They said, what have had this state done to study that? And so what we've talked about, I think, uh, before this group is what studies, what information is out there to determine um, how you're going to define that social equity applicant and that DIA section. There needs to be some evidence you have backed up about what the impact was from cannabis prohibition. Uh, and that should, I think, in my mind, move to the kind of the forefront on the study of, of what that is. This is for your social equity program. And I, I know that you're walking on the path of social equity and a DEI program, which again, I think is both subject to that same constitutional scrutiny. Um, but I, I probably talked long enough about those thoughts. Um, did, does that make sense to everyone? Tom, it makes sense to me. I, I guess I would ask, and Dave, I don't, I don't know if you can do this, but um, can we get a one pager on just the law, um, really summarizing, Tom, what you just said on that Ohio case and others to really understand uh, the distinction, the complexity um, that you just outlined. You know, when I think about that and read, um, this quote from, uh, I guess, Forbes, you know, this is our challenge. We need, we need to do our homework here in Vermont and, and get, our, get, get our data ready so we can make our argument, so we can defend, um, hopefully, uh, a, a social equity program uh, that is broad and inclusive and provides opportunity to, to the folks that we intended to. Uh, but as we know as lawyers, we get to we get add the evidence. Yeah, and I, I can I can email, I'm happy to email you the case. Again, that that's one court in one state, right? Um, but just be aware of the risks. So one of our challenges is that we do not have a disproportionately impacted report. Um, but I know the Cannabis Control Board and other departments are trying to um, get the information and reports um, that we need in order to verify our information. Um, and if you know of any reports out there that can help us support our social equity applicants, um, that would be tremendously helpful to send that our way. Um, so 
So social equity isn't so easy after all. You know, there's a lot that really goes into this. And, you know, with these challenges, we're going to try to make the, the best decision possible and really try to create a really inclusive industry. I will say, um, you know, everybody in Vermont seems to be very supportive of these programs. So I'm really, really happy to see that. Do we have any comments or questions before we leave this session? Well, thank you everyone. I'm going to move to adjourn. We've got the next subcommittee meeting starting in three minutes. Uh, if I can get a second, uh, we will join everyone again on Monday. Second. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>